In fact, today, just to give you a heads up, we're in Ruth chapter 3. At best, some of the content today is going to be PG-13. And so I want to give you a heads up that if you're watching online or listening at home, if you've got this up on the, the TV screen and all the kids are running around, you may want to mute this and come back later. Uh, in this room, we've opened up our children's ministry today to any, anybody through eighth grade who, who wants to go in there and hang out because we're, we're going to talk about some stuff. We don't back away from scripture. It's going to be tasteful. It's not going to be crass, but we're, we're just going to talk about what the scripture says. So if you're uh, not excited about that, Welcome to Redemption Church. Uh, you know what? It's tough to be me today. I'm just going to be honest. One of the things many of you have said to me over and over again is we've never been in a sermon series on the book of Ruth. And I'm like, you're right, because Ruth chapter 3 exists. And nobody wants to preach through it. Nobody wants to talk through it. But we're going to do it today. So listen, grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible, grab a pen. Well, we just won't make lots of eye contact and the embarrassing points. All right, but we're going to get through it together for the glory of Jesus. I'm going to read Ruth chapter 3, and then we're going to pray and get started. Would you read with me? Ruth chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he lie down at the end of a heap of grain. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after a young man, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain here tonight, and in the morning I will redeem you. Good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning." So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you were wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came in to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Do you pray with me? Father God, we come before you this morning in the great name of Jesus. God, we are so thankful that you are who you say you are. And God, I just think even as we were worshiping today, I was just reminded that of all the great things that you have done throughout history, that is the Bible accounts that you are a way maker, God, that you are a miracle worker, that you're the God that makes a way when there is no way, God, that you are faithful and that you are true. And God, I'm reminded of that because I, I, I think that the things that you have done are reminders and examples that you always come through. And God, that even in the midst of uncertainty in our own lives, we can trust you because you are who you say you are. God, I pray as we study your word this morning, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you'd make yourself known to us. God, admittedly, Ruth chapter 3 is kind of awkward, and yet we believe that it is your word, good, living, active, that you want us to go through it and examine it and apply it to our lives in the ways that we can for your glory and our good. So God, as we study today, as we talk through your scripture, God, I pray that your voice would be heard, that your spirit would awaken our hearts and our minds to you, God, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of your word. It would be for your glory, for our good, and for the benefit of others. Jesus, we ask this in your name, the name above all names. Amen. Amen. Now, as we get into Ruth 3, this is Ruth. 
And I want to remind you, because I've already given you the disclaimer, it's a little bit awkward, it's a little bit PG-13, but I want to remind you of this. The reason we're not skipping this over is because it's God's Word, and it's even more than that. This is part of our story. The story of Ruth is part of our story. Here's why. We all experience pain, difficulty, suffering, and the unknown in our lives, all of us. And Ruth reminds us over and over again that God is good, that God is sovereign, and God is always working. We, we say it this way, we've been talking about the providence of God, something we don't talk about often, but maybe we should talk about more, that if God is sovereign and working, if God knows what you need and he's willing to provide, and that means that in all situations and all times, God is working, even when you don't sense it, even when you don't feel it, even when things don't make sense, God is always working. And he can be trusted, and you can remain faithful to him. In fact, I think one of the major themes of Ruth when it comes to God's providence is this, is when God is at work, bitter hopelessness can be the beginning of something good. I mean, that was part of Thad's testimony this morning, right? Like, we go from Ruth to Thad. Like, I, I'm at a job. It's not great. I'm looking for a new job. Hey, hey, Jesus, would you provide me with a new job? And it, it seems like I found the job, and that doesn't work out. And we get stuck in the details. I want this job. It's not working out. Why? Why aren't things coming together? And can we pause, and can we breathe, and can we believe? that God's at work. That even in the frustration, even in the midst of all those things, that God's work. That one of the things we've said over and over again is when God is at work, bitter hopelessness can be the beginning of something good. Now, it's more than that. The story of Ruth is deeper than that. Because the story of Ruth actually leads us to Jesus. The story of Ruth is an incredible reminder of God not only being at work, but this, that your past does not define you. Over and over again, and even in this chapter, Ruth will be referred to as a Moabite. Like, we, we know her past. We know where she's from. We know the history. We know what her people are like. And yet, God's not done with her. That God can use people like you and me, people with backgrounds, people with history, people with brokenness, people with skeletons in our closet. Your past does not define you when your father is in the room. And don't forget that this is the story of Ruth. Ruth is a widowed Moabite woman who becomes, by God's grace, the mother of a royal dynasty. Not by anything that she's done, but because of God working in her life, that Ruth follows Naomi home to Bethlehem and meets Boaz. Uh, they will be married, and their marriage will lead to King David. And from the line of King David comes Jesus. Ruth is one of the only women referred to in the genealogy of Jesus, this widowed Moabite woman who is overlooked, who does not have any good credentials, becomes one of the women that is in the line of Jesus. This story is part of our story. And this week gets a little weird. And I want to just give you a reminder of where we've been because this is a totally different scene. Chapter 1 is filled with devastation, lost. There's no hope. There's no joy. Amilelech moves his wife Naomi and his two kids to Moab where there's food because there's, uh, there's no food. There's famine in Bethlehem. Amilelech dies and so do his two sons, leaving Naomi now with two daughter-in-laws who are Moabite women who technically are enemies of God. Chapter 2, there's some hope begins to peek through the clouds, like on an overcast day when some sunbeams come through. They come back to Bethlehem. Uh, Ruth decides to cling to Naomi. She has a relationship with God. She says, Naomi, you're my people. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you go, I will go. And where you die, I will be buried. And there's more. There's this kinsman redeemer. There's this one who can provide provision, one who can provide protection, access, one who can take famine and turn it into plenty. And now we get to chapter three, and it is a total change of scene. If this was a play that you were attending, they would close the curtain and they would give you a break because we now have to totally reset the stage. We are no longer in the field. We are no longer in public. We are no longer in the eye of many. We are now going to go to the private, to the dark where there's no one looking on. And what we find at the beginning of chapter 3 is a drastic change also in attitude from the end of chapter 2. The end of chapter 2, remember, Ruth comes home with all this grain that, that, that Boaz has provided. It's an abundance. It's plenty. And we find both Ruth and Naomi enjoying the providence of God, enjoying the blessing of God, enjoying that they now have jars filled with grain so that they can eat. And yet chapter 3 opens... And Naomi decides 
that even though God has blessed them, even though that the providence of God has shown up, it's now time for her to take control and to force the hand of God, or at least to take matters into her own hands. Isn't this true for all of us? Like, haven't we all been there? My life would just be better if, if I could just get this one thing checked off the to-do list, if I could just obtain, if I could just get God to, we've all been there. And yet what we'll discover is that this is risky business. And I think whenever you and I try to force the hand of God, whenever we get out of God's will, God's way, and God's time, odds are it will not be good for us. And this is where Naomi is. She's got a taste of what she wants for Ruth. Hey, you've met Boaz, our kinsman redeemer, and we have some food and you have some provision, you have some protection. He's given you access. And what Naomi's heart is this, I wish you had more of it permanently. Like, I don't want this to be temporary. I want you to have this permanently. And the only way for her to get that is through marriage. This is what she says, Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? This is, this is her prayer in chapter 1, which she is now, in the beginning of chapter 3, saying again, like, here's what I need. I want you to find rest. And the only way that Ruth is going to find rest in this culture, in this time, is marriage. No husband means no provision, no protection, no access. So she says, Ruth, I think Boaz is the guy. We, we need to find you permanent provision, permanent protection, permanent access. I want you to have love. I want you to have a family. I want you to have an inheritance. So now she hatches a plan. Verse 2, is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were in the field? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place that he lies, and go and cover his feet, and lie down, and do what he tells you to do. And she replies, I'll do all that you tell me to do. Now, let's just be really, really clear for a second. Bad advice from good people is still bad advice. Like, can we just be really clear on that? Like, I would write that down or tweet it or make a note of it. Bad advice from good people is still bad advice. This is why we say over and over again, when we hear God's word or if we're searching for God's will, one of the ways we confirm that is in the community of gospel-centered people, right? Like, we need to get together with other people who love Jesus, who know his word, and care about us enough to tell the truth. Because what Naomi is offering Ruth is really, really bad advice. And yet Ruth, out of loyalty to Naomi, says, I'll do all that I've told you to do. Now here's what's happening. I'll give you a picture because none of this really makes sense in our culture. Harvest season is over. This is kind of the crescendo. This is the exclamation part. The, the grain has been taken out of the field and it is now on the threshing room floor. Uh, this is a, a time of harvest and the process of winnowing is simply this, is where the grain is taken to the threshing room floor, which is usually bedrock or hard stamped earth. And the grain is then laid down. It's either trampled, smashed. Sometimes they would roll carts over it, dragged by animals. And what happened is the kernel would separate from the stalk and from the shaft, and you'd be left with a pile of mess on the ground. And then the, the, what they do is there would be a, a breeze that would come through the threshing room floor, and you would literally pick up the pile and throw it in the air. And what happened is the kernel, which is the heaviest, would fall to the ground. The stalks and the shaft would go further away. The stalks would then be gathered and used to feed animals of straw. The shaft would be gathered and be used for fuel for fire. The kernels, the gold that they're after, would then be brought into large piles and be sold in the morning. Now remember, there has been famine in the land for 10 years. This harvest is huge. This harvest means everything. This harvest means there is now bread in Bethlehem, the house of bread. But it also means for guys like Boaz that he can pay his staff in a way that he's not been able to pay his staff for 10 years. Like the economy is booming. Money is flowing. You can think of it this way. It is payday at the threshing room floor and the economy in Bethlehem will be bustling and hustling. It will be like Black Friday, but it starts here. People have money. They're looking to spend money. There is celebration and there is rejoicing. It is a great jubilee in the threshing room floor. But it is strange that Boaz would be where he is. 
We have no idea how Naomi knows where Boaz will be. Maybe she heard it on the street. Maybe she's been doing some mother-in-law investigation. Maybe because she's playing matchmaker, she knows everything about this guy's life. But it is strange that Boaz, a property owner, we know in chapter 2 that he has staff. In fact, he has managers that oversee staff. So it is strange that he is in the threshing room floor. Why is he there? We don't know. Is he there to oversee the operation because they haven't done it in 10 years? Is he there to help? Is he there to make sure that it's done quickly? Is he there to protect the grain from thieves? We simply have no idea. But what we do know is it's festive, it's joyous, it's the pinnacle of a harvest. People are getting paid in a way they haven't been paid in a long time. They're getting paid for months of work. There's celebration. And here's Naomi's terrible advice to Ruth. Ruth take a bath. Get as pretty as you can get. Do your hair. Put on your best dress. Anoint yourself with oil and perfume. You want to be physically attractive, visually attractive. You need to smell good. And I want you to go to Boaz, because here's what we know. Boaz is a hard worker with a big harvest. And at the end of the day, he will eat a big meal. He will be satisfied with his work. He'll have a pile of grain that will be sold in the morning. And when his belly's full, he will lay next to that grain and he will be in a really good mood. And then you're going to uncover his feet. And then, daughter, do everything that he tells you to do. Now, parents, this is not good dating advice, is it? I mean, dads, right? Like you have a daughter. Your daughter goes, hey, dad, I have a boy who I think is really interested in me. Your advice is not go take a bath, put on your best dress, like maybe a little provocative, put on your best perfume, go on a date, go to a secluded place in the dark, and here's what I want you to do, sweetie. Do whatever that young man tells you to do and do it gladly. Anybody getting that advice? Or dads, are you loading the gun? Loading the gun. I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, I'm going with. But this is Naomi's advice. It's bad advice. Now, I want to point out to you, because this is important when we read scripture, what is this? The book of Ruth is a historical short story. We have to look at it this way. This passage of scripture is descriptive. It is telling us all that took place. It is not prescriptive. The scripture is not saying, this is how you date. It is not saying you should go do it this way. It isn't saying how this is how you live. This is just saying what happened. The Bible is always truthful and honest with us. There are passages and situations in the Bible that are messy and uncomfortable because life is messy and uncomfortable. And for the first listeners, like I imagine for us today, this is highly uncomfortable. This is where in the movie the music begins to change because this is not a place for a lady. And this is not a situation that any single woman should be in. To make matters worse, because I'll just be as truthful with you as I know how to be, Hosea chapter 9 verse 1 tells us that when the threshing room floor is filled with men who are working and there's money flowing, that prostitutes would visit the threshing room floor. Good mood, single men, lots of money, there's an economy and not all of it's good. And yet Naomi tells Ruth, hey, I want you to dress up. I want you to get pretty. I want you to put on the perfume. And I want you to go to the threshing room floor where all of this is taking place. So verse 6 and 7, so she went down to the threshing room floor and she did as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz has eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and he lay down. I have to be clear on this. Often... When we read scripture, we read with a mirror. What I mean by that is we see ourselves in the scripture, and that's not always wrong, but here's the thing. Often, we will take our own thoughts, our own background, our own history, our own culture, and put it into scripture without allowing this just to say, what does the scripture actually say? Here's why this is important. Many people will read this passage and say, Boaz got drunk. There's no indication that there was alcohol. The Hebrew word that is used here actually means that he is satisfied with a meal. That it's like this idea that he worked a hard day's work. At the end of the day, he ate a good meal, and he is satisfied, physically satisfied, emotionally satisfied. He is merry, not drunk. Now, what happens next makes no sense to us. But in this culture, it did. It says that Ruth uncovered Boaz's feet and lay next to him. Now, there's really two options with this. 
And either option is an option you can choose. I think it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure, and here's why. Option number one is that laying down and uncovering Boaz's feet was actually an invitation for romance, intimacy, and sex. That's how the first readers would have heard this. Like, oh, this is forward. Oh, we're not supposed to see this. This is where you turn the channel. Like, this isn't something you're supposed to watch, and yet this is what's happening. Option number two is this, that Naomi is actually creating a plan. This is like 007 James Bond kind of stuff. That what Naomi has actually come up with is she's trying to create a Hallmark movie type moment. Here, here's the scene, right? Boaz harvest has come to an end. He's worked a hard day. He's paid his workers. There's money in the bank. He's already thinking of next year's harvest. He's gone above and beyond. Not only did he provide for his workers, but he's provide for gleaners in the field. And he even took the next step and provided for Ruth. He's smiling. He's laying on the floor. He's looking at the stars in the sky. He's next to a pile of grain, which is in this time essentially like a pile of gold. And his belly is full. He's just eaten a good meal. He can maybe still smell the meal on his beard. His belly and his heart are full, and he is savoring the reward of harvest. It is quiet now. Life is good. And his eyes begin to get heavy as he drifts away to sleep. Ruth, out of the shadows, approaches slowly and carefully and uncovers his feet and then lays down. As the night gets cooler, his feet become cold. What happens when your feet become cold when you're asleep? You wake up. You pull the sheets You want to cover your feet because there's nothing worse than cold feet when you're asleep. And so here's Boaz who now, why are my feet cold? And he begins to move. And there at his feet is a beautiful young woman who just so happens to be lying next to him. And as he opens his eyes, he'll see her and they will fall in love. And he'll get on a knee and propose to her in that moment. And the Hallmark movie will end and the snow will fall and the music will play. Which option is it? I don't know. But here's what I do know. No matter what option you choose, Ruth is incredibly vulnerable in this situation. She's an outsider. She has no legal rights. She has no protection. Whatever happens is completely up to Boaz. I think this is where the narrator wants us to go. How will this work out? How will Boaz respond? No matter what option you think is happening here, this is delicate sexuality at great risk. Ruth is making herself available to a very well-known, highly esteemed, wealthy business owner who has the opportunity to redeem both her and Naomi or could be so offended that he sends her away. In this moment, in Holy Scripture, Boaz and Ruth find themselves alone, lying side by side on a threshing room floor. Heaven is present, but almost seems absent. This is exactly where the narrator wants us, because then verse 8, at midnight, the man startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lied at his feet. Well, why midnight? All throughout the Old Testament in Israel's history, midnight has been a time of momentous events. The narrator is saying, hey, heaven seems absent, but actually heaven is near. It's at midnight that the final plague fell on Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. It's at midnight that Samson escapes escapes ambush in Judges 16.3. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable, and it is at midnight that the bridegroom shows up in the parable. Midnight is a time where God shows up and does the expected, unexpected. Verse 9. Boaz, now awake with cold feet, startled at the smell, and we'll assume the the visual appearance, the aroma of this woman at his feet. He says, who are you? And she answers, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, this is important because what were Naomi's instructions to Ruth? Go, make yourself beautiful, uncover his feet, and when he wakes up, do whatever he tells you to do. Ruth said, that's not my style. He wakes up, asks the question, and Ruth now tells Boaz what to do. It's me, Ruth, marry me. Ruth makes it abundantly clear she is here for one reason. I know how this looks. I know how it could look. I know how it could look to you. I know how it could look to others around you. But here's what I'm after. I'm not after a moment of pleasure. I'm after a lifetime of commitment. Would you marry me? 
But that's what she means when she says, would you spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. In this culture, a sign of engagement back then wasn't a ring. It was a public display where the man would take the corner of his cloak and hold it over a woman saying, she is now mine. She's under my protection, my provision. Her access comes through me. Don't miss the parallel imagery of Boaz's prayer in verse 2. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth says, hey, Boaz, I'm not exactly sure what Naomi wanted, but here's what I want. Remember what you prayed for me? Remember that you told me that God would reward me because of my faith, because of the way I've cared for Naomi, that you told me that the God of Israel is like an eagle who protects her young under his wing. What if the way that God wants to protect me is by actually putting me under your wing? Hey, Boaz, would you marry me? Ruth says, this is about marriage. She's in a vulnerable state. She has no legal right. This is not like, have you ever done this? Like, it's super weird. But I remember like in junior high, there was a Sadie Hawkins dance where like the girl asked the guy, anybody, anybody, Sadie Hawkins dance? Yeah, they, like they didn't do that back then. Like no Sadie Hawkins dance. Like completely inappropriate for a woman to ask a man. Like, I know we live now, like, totally appropriate. Like, hey, ladies, if you're with him and he hasn't put a ring on it, ask. And if he says no, find somebody else like Boaz. I mean, I'm just saying. But, like, here's the thing. She makes it abundantly clear. We're going to talk about this in a minute. I think this is what we'll call strategic righteousness. Hey, Boaz, I know what could take place. I know what could happen. I know how this proposal looks. But here's what I want you to know. I'm not here for that. I'm actually here for marriage. Like, hey, Boaz, it's actually time for you to answer your own prayer. Would you spread your cloak over me? Would you marry me? Would you spread your wings over me? Now, here's what we know about Boaz. This is interesting. Remember, Boaz has been referred to as a worthy man. That, that, that title, worthy man, means he's a man of wealth. He knows how to make money. He's a provider. He doesn't just care for himself, but he cares for those around him. If you're looking for a job, you want to work for Boaz. He's also heroic. We don't have the details, but a worthy man is that he's a protector of the innocent. There's a possibility that he's some sort of war hero. But he's also a man of substance. He gets things done, and he has value to the people and to the places around him. But here's the deal. There is never a report that Boaz has ever been married, that he's single. And in this time and in this culture, for a man like Boaz to not be married would be odd. Because after all, he would have a great inheritance to pass on. He is a great man with a high reputation. Why does he have no wife? And this becomes important in how he responds next in verse 10, because Boaz says to Ruth, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. For you have made this last kindness greater than the first, that you have not gone after a young man, whether rich or poor. That word kindness is that word again, hased, that we talked about in week one. There is no English word that is equal to the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed reflects the covenantal love, mercy, grace, kindness, goodness, benevolence, loyalty, and covenant faithfulness of God. If we could say it this way, hesed moves a person to act for the benefit of another without respect to the advantage or disadvantage it may bring to the one who expresses it. Boaz is highly aware that Ruth's marriage proposal is not just about Ruth. Ruth is like, listen, you could marry any guy in Bethlehem. Like, guys, you should use that as a Christian pickup line. Hey, girl, you could marry any guy in Bethlehem. And that's what he says to her. Like, listen, you could go after a young man, but you're here after an old man. And the reason you're here is actually because of the kindness that you've had. This is what he's saying. Remember chapter one, she comes home, she makes a covenant, she cares for her. Chapter two, why, Boaz, are you blessing me? Because I've heard about the kindness you've showed to Naomi, and I've heard about your faith in the Lord. He goes, you would marry me because it benefits Naomi. Like, you could marry any guy in town that would benefit you, but you want to marry me, not just because of you, but also because of Naomi. Now, now, here's the thing. Ruth is beautiful. Ruth is probably jacked. Like, I don't know if they had CrossFit back then, 
But if they did, Ruth competed. And I'm going to show you that again this week. And what Ruth says to Boaz is, Boaz, I choose you. I choose you because you're good. I choose you because you're good not just for me, but you're also good for Naomi. If you marry me, I know that I will experience love and provision and protection and rest. But here's the thing, so will my mother-in-law. So Boaz, I choose you. And what Boaz says in his response is that Naomi's request for marriage is not selfish or motivated by greed, but it is hased. It is steadfast love and kindness. And this is the moment then where, if this were a Hallmark movie, you'd begin to hear chapel bells, and in would walk the wedding planner, and they would begin talking about colors and food for the wedding. And what Boaz says to her in verse 11 is this, is now my daughter, daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Don't miss this. Boaz is a worthy man. And he now takes that same title and gives it to Ruth. He says, Ruth, you are a worthy woman. What he means is this, is some people might object to me, Boaz, marrying a Moabite woman, but not in Bethlehem. Because the way that you've cared for Naomi, the way that you've lived your life, the way that you've exhibited your faith, the way that you've shown up and worked hard in the field to provide for not just you, but also Naomi, he says this, people know that you're a worthy woman. Don't miss this. Your work is connected to your worship. I heard one person say it this way this week, is more than your Sunday morning worship, your work may reveal more about your, your relationship with God than your Sunday morning worship. For Ruth, that's true. That he says, listen, you came into this town as an enemy of Israel, and now this entire town would say that you are a worthy woman. This is where we should be excited. This is where we start to plan the wedding cake. This is where we set the date and we work on the invitations. And then Boaz says this, and now it's true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain here tonight in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he's not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. Boaz says, hey, I think this is good. Like, I will marry you and redeem you, but here's the problem. As far as it comes to kinsmen's redeemers, there's one that's actually closer related to Naomi than me. And Boaz says, if we're going to be married, then we have to do it the right way. God's will, God's way, and God's time. So here's what we have to do. We have to go ask the other guy first. And listen to what Boaz says. If he chooses to redeem you, then good. Boaz says, I want you to know my heart is worship. I want to marry you, but it's got to be God's will, and we have to do it God's way, and it has to be in God's time. So we'll go to this redeemer, and don't miss the difficulty of this. This is not duty. This is desire. Boaz is like, it is my duty, but I desire you. I'm supposed to marry you, but I want to marry you. But if we're going to do this, we have to do it the right way. If God is the God of our story, then we walk by faith. His will, his way, his time. Now, again, I think we're going to use this word strategic righteousness. I think this is true again for Boaz. He makes the the assumption first. He says, I want you to stay here tonight. Now, this is sketchy. This whole thing is sketchy. But what he says is, I want you to stay here tonight. The word is actually lodge. And what he means is this. If you leave this place, I can't protect you. But when you're in my presence, I can. This is the exact same concern he showed her when he said, stay to my field. No one will lay a hand on you here. But I says, listen, everybody here knows me. No one would mess with me. If you're with me, you're safe. But out there, where well, there's a, hunch of, a bunch of people who just got paid, where there may be thieves and marauders. Like, I can't control what happens between here and home, so stay here for tonight. But it's more than that. Boaz is saying, Ruth, we need to protect your reputation. If you are seen leaving this place in the middle of the night, it will be assumed that you came here for certain things and none of them will be good. It'll be assumed that you came to seduce me. It'll be assumed that you came to entice me. Even worse, it could be assumed that you were here as a prostitute trying to make money. If that happens, I will not be able to redeem you. And according to the law, Boaz and the Bethlehem men would have to run her out of Bethlehem and return her to Moab. And if this happens, now Naomi the widow has no one to care for her, no one to provide for her. And no one to be with her. 
And so what Boaz does is he comes up with what we'll call a suitable exit. He says, listen, I don't know why Naomi sent you here. We are in a risky situation. There's a lot on the line here, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to do our best with what we have. So verse 14 says, so she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before anyone could recognize another. And Boaz said, let it be known, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment that you are wearing and hold it out. This is probably her head covering. So she held it out and he measured about six measures of barley and put it on her. And she went into the city. Now, we, we don't know what an ephah was. We talked about that last week. But a measure of barley would have somehow between, the six measures of barley would have been somehow between 60 and 95 pounds of barley kernels. I'm telling you, this lady was jacked. Like he gives her somewhere between 60 and 95 pounds, wraps it up in her cloak, probably ties it around her shoulders, and goes, now walk home. Why? Because this is a familiar sight in Bethlehem. People are used to seeing Ruth carrying grain from Boaz's field to Naomi's home. So if anybody said, hey, we saw Ruth at the threshing room floor, they'd be like, yeah, did you also see the load of grain she had? You know why she went to the threshing room floor? To get grain. Just like everybody else goes to the threshing room floor to get grain. Now again, just like in chapter 2, the narrator writes this in such a way that Ruth and Naomi have a conversation. Ruth leaves, and we follow the story of Ruth, and at home is Naomi, waiting, worrying, wondering, what's happening? How is God working? Is the plan working? How did it go? And now Ruth and Naomi's story come back together. It says, when she came to her, her mother-in-law said, how did it fare, my daughter? Her question is, are you okay? Are you single? Are you married? Tell me what happened. Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest but he will settle the matter today. This phrase, I think, is really important. In fact, what Ruth says is, this six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law, is the last time we hear Ruth speak in the book of Ruth. It's like her final words. But it's foreshadowing. She said, Boaz sent me home with this grain for you. Well, why is this important? Well, chapter one, remember Naomi said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter. And then she's this, she says, I left full and I came home empty. What Boaz says is, we will not leave her empty handed. We will take her empty handedness and replace it with fullness. Well, how much? Somewhere between 60 and 95 pounds worth. The Boaz sent grain home, not only to cover Ruth, but also to then say, hey, Naomi, I want you to know that God's at work. Like, there, there's some things that have to happen. There's some things that have to fall into place. But I want you to know is that we will not leave you empty-handed. Your emptiness will be replaced with fullness. This is foreshadowing of what's to come. And this is exactly where the narrator wants us to be at the end of chapter 3, asking this question, what will happen? Well, once again, will God show up? And how will he show up? Who will redeem Ruth and Naomi? Will it be Boaz or will it be this other guy that we just learned about? But more than that, I think we have to ask the question in Ruth chapter 3, well, what is in it for us? Like, what do we learn? How do we interact with this scripture? What do we apply? The application is not this. Date this way. That is not what the scripture is saying. In fact, for us, I think here's the thing that Scripture says in Ruth chapter 3 to you and I. It's a reminder that worship is a lifestyle. What I mean by that is all of your life is worship. That Jesus looks at all of your life and says, it is mine, it is for me, I want to be a part of it. I want you to give me glory and honor by saying yes to me in all areas of your life. Not just one or not just two, we don't get to compartmentalize, but all of your life belongs to Jesus. Specifically, in Ruth chapter 3, a call for worship in your sexuality. And what we could say is, Ruth chapter 3 is actually a call for sexual purity. It's all about worship, God's will, God's way, in his timing. And this is so important for us because we live in a culture of compromise. 
See, our question isn't normally, how do we worship God and honor God with our sexuality? The question is this, where is the line? How close can I get to the line? Can we touch the line without crossing the line? Can we redefine the line? And how far is really too far? And once we go there, are we sure that we can't go just a little bit further? Like, listen, we live in a culture now that we have so rejected God's will, God's way, and God's timing that now we reject God so that we can create our own version of sexuality. We can go, listen, we want to get away from this because we want to experience something different from this. And what God says is, no, no, my way, my timing, my will. Because God who created us, God who created the world and all things in it, God who gave us breath and life, God who created marriage says, listen, I've created certain things for certain seasons, and when they're done the right way and the right time, they're really good for you. But when we get outside of God's will and we get outside of God's way and we get outside of God's timing, it never goes well. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Here's what I love about Ruth and Boaz. I think, as I read chapter 3, I see two strategic times where they both play the long game. Like Ruth goes, hey, hey, I know how this looks, but like marry me. Hey, like real quick, I'm going to tell you what to do. I want you to marry me, and you know the customs and the way that works, so I'm not here for anything else but that, but marry me. And Boaz goes, I will marry you, and by the way, we got to get you home safe and sound with your reputation intact. They play the long game. Neither Ruth nor Boaz lived for the moment. I mean, that would have been a story to tell. Like we could live for the moment. We can pursue our dreams. We can seek the, the, the satisfaction of experience what we want to experience now, But Ruth and Boaz go, there's something better than that. What's better than that is experiencing the favor of God in all areas of lives, including our sexuality, God's will, God's way, God's timing. What do I mean? God specifically created marriage as one man and one woman. And God specifically created sex as something to be experienced between a man and a woman who are married in covenantal love. I've heard it this way. It was told to me this way. I say it all the time, and I know it's cheesy, but it's the best way, I think, to think about it. Fire is incredibly great when it's handled the right way. In many ways, marriage is like a fireplace. It's a place where fire is meant to be burnt and enjoyed and heated the whole home. And so when you start a fire in the fireplace, it's actually good. It's enjoyable. It heats the entire home, and it's something that's pleasurable and and good. Now, if you started a fire on the carpet in your living room floor, nobody calls that good. No one says, isn't this wonderful? It heats the whole homes. Oh, now it's crawling up the curtains and, and getting the whole roof. It's not great. You see, God gives us his will, his way, his timing for us, for our good, so we can experience his goodness and our blessing. Don't miss this. This is not religiousness. This is not God's given us all these rules. We have to cross all these T's and dot all these I's and live all this. No, no, it's because God loves you. It's because God wants you to experience what's best for you. That there's actually power and protection and provision in righteousness. And see, when I say strategic righteousness, here's what I mean. Strategic meaning intentional. Righteousness meaning a passion and a commitment to do what is good and right in the eyes of God. I'm not calling you to religion. We don't want religion. What we want is worship. To say, listen, because God loves me, because he knows me and what's best for me, because the tomb is empty, because he's saved me from sin and he's promised me abundant life, because God wants me to live for more than just the moment, I will worship him. I'll say yes to him. I'll choose his way over my immediate desire believing that he'll meet me and that he'll bless me, and in the long run, it will be good. I love the way John Piper says it. He said it this way. He said, I say to you, if the stars are shining in their beauty and your blood is thudding like a hammer and you are safe in the privacy of your place, stop for the sake of righteousness. Let the morning dawn on your purity Do not be like the world. Be like Boaz. Be like Ruth. Profoundly in love, subtle and perceptive in communication, powerful in self-control, committed 
to righteousness. So then we have to ask the question, how? How do we live for the glory of God? How do we experience the righteousness of God in a culture of compromise? And the answer is by the power of God. Like he has not left us to do this on our own, but he's invited us into a relationship with us where he gives us power. Now, what's interesting is I think a lot of times we have this narrative in our head when we experience trial, when we experience weakness, when we experience temptation, when we experience an overwhelming desire to do something that we know is not God's way, God's will, or God's time, we tend to run from God. But the scripture says that we're invited to run to God, that we're, uh, we're allowed to take our safety and refuge in him, that he would actually give us strength in our trial, strength in our temptation. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now here's what I love about this passage. Number one, it tells us that Jesus experienced everything that we experienced in the flesh. So he understands our temptation. He knows. Like, he gets it. It's not like book knowledge. He lived it. He experienced it. He knows it's enticing. He knows the power. He knows what it's like to really, really want or to decide to something that's outside of God's way, God's will, and God's time, and yet he chose his father. And so because he's a great high priest, because he's done this, he is able to give us power. He is able to minister to us and give us power in those moments. And then as I read this today, I'm reminded, oh yeah, Ruth. This is a story of Ruth and Boaz, the great-great-grandparents of David, the ancestors of Jesus. So as Jesus says, hey, I know, he goes, not only that, like, this is part of my family story. Like, this is part of how, like, I, I came to be through this line that we actually have Ruth and Boaz who are able to look at temptation and choose righteousness instead of the immediate desires. In an age of compromise, in an age of digital opportunity, in an age of redefinition of what's right and what's wrong, in an age that says, just be young and be free, be safe, but have all the experiences you need, hear the voice of God today. Your feelings do not dictate heaven. Heaven dictates your feelings. And in an age of opportunity and compromise, there's a better way secured for you by your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who experienced all that you experienced and chose righteousness, who died in your place for your sins and rose again on the third day so that you might be fully forgiven, fully loved, fully accepted, a fully adopted son or daughter of the Most High God whose spirit now lives in you. He provides you with a different way. That you don't have to sin, you could actually choose righteousness that you don't have to fall victim to your desires, but rather you could experience the blessing of God by choosing his way, his will, and his time. So for some of us, that means as singles, we need to honor God in our singleness. His will, his way, his time. And I know for most people who are single, the question is this, well, when? I don't know. Until that day comes, until your Boaz or your Ruth shows up, the best possible thing you can do is choose God's will, God's way, God's time. For some of you in dating relationships, that means you need to continue to choose God's will, God's way, God's time. The scripture often talks about not awaking romance until the proper time. There's some things that are only proper to awaken in a marriage relationship. So for those of you that are dating, There's some things that just remain off limits until you say yes, forever, amen to one another. And that means you need to have strategies in place. That means you have to have things that you just say, hey, these are off limits to us. Even though we desire and it might feel great and we could live for the moment, you could choose to live for a better story. That means for those of you that are married, it means that what takes place in your bedroom is actually worship, but so is what takes place in your heart and your mind. Like the things that you look at affect you. The things that you watch affect you. The things on your TV, the things on your computer, the relationships you have with members of the opposite sex in the workplace or the grocery store, they matter. 
And the best possible thing you can offer yourself, your, your, your spouse, or your family is choosing God's will, God's way, and God's time. Now, for some of us, we, we're left with this question. So what happens if we've messed up in this area in our lives? <laughs> well, we just finished where we started. Your past doesn't define you. Never has, never will. God is the God of the second story. When you go to him, he loves you. He forgives you. He makes you white as snow. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. There's no shame. You are no longer defined by that. But because of his salvation, his grace, and his mercy, and his love, you're just invited into a better way that you could choose even beginning today. That's all we have. Hey, God, from today forward, I choose in this area of sexuality and purity your will, your way, and your time. And hey, God, I won't be perfect, but instead of running from you, I'm going to run to you, and I'm going to trust you because I think it will, and it might, and it will, and it could, but ultimately your will, your way, and your time. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you in the great name of Jesus. And Father, most of us, when we got up this morning and thought, hey, let's go to church, didn't think we'd be talking about what we're talking about. And yet, Jesus, we believe that your word is true and holy. God, I believe that when uh, you knew that we would be on this chapter today and everybody who's here is supposed to be interacting with you through your word on this topic. And so, God, we just trust that you're speaking and that you're working. God, I thank you for the reminder today, God, that our past doesn't define us no matter what's in our past. But rather, you, God, define us. God, I thank you that you're a God that invites us into a better way. I thank you that you're a God that actually loves us so much that you care about the little details of our lives, including things like sexuality and relationships and dating and marriage. And God, I pray that as we hear your word this morning, that we would be doers of your word. God, I pray just in this moment that there would be men and women in this room who would say, hey, God, all of me, I'm yours. And God, that we would invite you even into the intimate details of our lives. Not because we have religious hearts, but because, God, we want to experience you. We want to experience your blessing. We want to experience the outpouring of your presence in our lives. And we want to worship you and honor you in all areas of our, our lives because you first loved us because you died on the cross for our sins and rose again on the third day so that we might have life. So Jesus, in your name, the name above all names that we pray, amen.